All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Stephanie Rao from the National Council on Public History. Um, and today is the first webinar in the second part of what will now be a four-part series, <laughs> Exploring the National Park Service's Criteria for Establishing World War II Heritage Cities. Um, we did a series of six webinars earlier in the fall. Um, I'll paste a, a link in the chat to the recording for those. Um, and now this week, um, over the next four days, we're going to learn about the criteria for establishing World War II heritage cities for the purposes of applications and evaluation by Park Service staff from one more of the authors of our essay series on the topic. We will also put a link to that essay series in the chat momentarily. Um, Today, we will be hearing from Dr. Laura Oviedo on criteria three, war bond drives. A uh, few housekeeping notes as we get started. This webinar is being recorded for um, both anyone who registered and cannot attend or anyone who wishes to review the content afterwards. We will share links with you at the end of the series to those recordings. Closed captions have been enabled. Um, if you don't see them automatically, you can click the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please be sure to keep your microphone muted unless you've been called on to ask a question in the Q&A. And at any time, you can pop questions into the chat area, and we will note them for our Q&A with Dr. Oviedo at the end of the presentation. Um, and last, before we begin the presentation, I want to give a warm welcome to Dr. Turkaya Lowe from the National Park Service. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Turkaya Lowe. I'm principal historian for the National Park Service as well as deputy federal preservation officer and manager of the American World War II Heritage Cities Program. Um, under Section 907 of the John Dingell Act of 2019, the Secretary of the Interior of the Department of the Interior uh, may designate up to only one city or um, per state or territory as an American World War II heritage city um, to recognize the importance of the history of the United States domestic involvement in World War II as well as to recognize those who continue preservation and public education around this history. Uh, there are currently 18 jurisdictions that are designated as World War II heritage cities. Um, we're looking forward to designating more for the 2023 season in upcoming weeks. The legislated criteria for the program includes one, two major components. The first is contributions by a city and its environment environments to the World War II um, home front effort. And the second are achievements by the city and its environs to the preservation of the heritage and legacy of those city of that city's contributions to the war effort. So within the broad two broad categories that I just spoke of, there are 15 specific topics or sub areas in the war effort. Um, and the preservation and commemorative activities that were called out by the legislation. Um, so we are very excited to partner with NCPH and I cr our criteria essay authors like Dr. Oviedo uh, to further explore these topics, um, today being war bonds. Uh, we hope that you're able to join us for the upcoming webinars this week on other topics. Also, for more information, we provided links to both the essays and uh, the World War, II, World War II Heritage Cities Homefront uh, program website in the chat. If you have any specific questions, you can also contact myself or my colleague, Jason Okrasa, um, who is a program historian for the World War II Heritage Cities Program at aww2hc at nps.gov. And we will put that email address in the chat. 
thank you so much for joining us and hope to see you later this week for the other webinars. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome and overview. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Laura Oviedo who is an educator and public historian of the Latinx experience in the United States. Her research interests focus on Latinx civil rights, labor, belonging, and war. She's currently working on her first manuscript that narrates how national and hemispheric politics of race, democracy, and militarization shaped the lives of Latinas in Texas and Puerto Rico during World War II. Examining the roles of Mexican American and Puerto Rican women as service women, military family members, factory workers, youth volunteers, and sex workers offers an opportunity to learn how the war had distinct effects on Latinas, especially Latinas living in a heavily militarized U.S. colonial territory. Dr. Oviedo's research has been supported by the Smithsonian Institution, Society for Military History, University of Texas Austin Center for Mexican American Studies, Texas A&M University, Institute of Caribbean Studies at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, among other institutions. Thank you so much for partnering with us in this work, Dr. Oviedo, and for being here with us today to share. So I will turn it over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to start off by thanking everybody uh, for joining us today, and especially the team at NCPH and the National Park Service for organizing this webinar series. Um, with the original series that came out, I was, um, in other words, I guess I could phrase it better, but I was giving birth during that time. <laughs> so I was unable to make it. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your patience in organizing this at a much later date than the original series. So I really appreciate everybody taking the time out of their post Thanksgiving dinner break to joining us, um, <laughs> to hearing me talk about war bonds during World War II. Um, so I will start by providing a general overview of the war bonds, um, an introduction of the war bonds and the purposes and successes. And then I'll dive into some of the research that I found as I was, you know, diving into what was going, across, going on across the nation and thinking about um, ways in which we can uh, preserve that, um, preserve that history, but also to find different ways or even um, unconventional ways of looking for histories that have been pushed to the side or are still um, looking to be told. Um, and the American Heritage Cities program is a wonderful program to be able to do that, um, not just through research, but the preservation of these World War II home front um, efforts. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and Share my screen. Okay. <clears throat> so I will be covering again war bond drives uh, during World War II. And I will start by giving a brief overview of this great partnership uh, initiative that was announced by President Roosevelt in 1941. So on April 30, 1941, President Roosevelt announced on a broadcast that he was developing and encouraging a partnership between civilians and the government in order for them to fund the military endeavors of the war. But remember, at this point, the, the U.S. was not actively involved in the war yet. So at this point, the savings bonds were termed defense bonds. Um, it later changed in 1942 when they were actively involved. Um, it changed to the war bonds. Um, but he announced this on April 30, 1941. And in May 1st, 1941, he became the first person to purchase a war bond as a way to set an example for the American public and to encourage them to purchase one as well. So what were defense bonds and eventually war bonds? 
The defense bonds invited citizens to help finance the war by purchasing a savings bonds at increments of $25 to $1,000. Citizens would purchase the defense bonds at a rate of 75% face value. And then over time, two months, af two months after it was purchased, it would start to accrue a 2.9% interest. Um, and it had a 10 year maturity. There were three options for purchasers to assign these uh, war bonds. So you can either if you purchase them, you can either put them under your name or you can assign them to an individual that you wanted to purchase the war bond for. Or the second option was to apply two co-owners to that war bond. So then they would be the ones to receive the benefits of the, the value at the end of the when you would redeem it. Um, and then the third option was you would, you would assign um, yourself and then an inheritor in case there was a death um, by the beneficiary uh, before you were able to redeem it. So they had three different options as to how to handle the war bonds legally once purchased. The other option that... The, the other campaign, I should say, um, pushed by the Treasury Department was also the war savings stamps, which were smaller increments of basically savings. Um, and so it was they went at increments from 10 cents to a dollar. And this allowed not only uh, youth to be able to purchase these and use their you know allowances or monies that they would make with their with their jobs, but they also allowed a variety of workers and farmers and people that normally wouldn't be able to afford to buy a $25 or $1,000 bond, the savings stamps was one way to do that, um, to allow everybody to contribute to the war effort in that way. In 1942, like I said, they did end up changing the name to the war bonds. Um, for the purpose of the war bonds were, like I've already mentioned, is to finance the war. It was also a way that the government used to regulate the economy. So the government felt because of the extra, let's say, the extra money that was flowing in from the war production of, of uh, the war production effort uh, was bringing in a lot more money. So it kind of started to um, it started to build a consumer culture out of the Americans who had just gotten out of the depression, but the government didn't want that money to go to waste, um, and so they they felt that by bringing in these defense bonds that it would help and encourage uh, citizens to invest these bonds um, into banks and. Uh, where they would able, sorry, where they would be able to invest these bonds into these banks, have them stored there and secured, and then of course the government would borrow that money physically um, throughout the years, and then, you know, at the end of the day, when um, consumer when the purchasers wanted to take that money out, then they would not only get the face value of the um, of the bond that they purchased, but then they would also get the the interest rate that had been accrued. And so they felt that, okay, we're not gonna allow, uh, we're trying to shift the economy from a consumer economy to a wartime economy and have all of that money try to fund the war. And this became a really great strategy for them to do that. Um, it also, again, it, it's not just about the government and them wanting to save money and thinking of how to get, um, money out of circulation so that it would um, decrease in, or it wouldn't cause inflation. Um, but they also were giving um, citizens a form of accountability. And through that, they were kind of pulling at the heartstrings of like, hey, you know, you are part of the, um, you know, the American citizens citizenry and your men are out fighting in this war. And you know, this is your way of doing your part, especially for those who can't join the military or who can't leave home for other responsibilities to go work in different wartime industries. 
buying war bonds was a way for them to contribute to the war effort. So it served as a patriotic um, and civic, uh, patriotic support and civic participation. Uh, at the end of the day, the um, the war the war bond campaign ended up raising eight one hundred and eighty five billion dollars of the total cost of the war. The total cost of the war was three hundred and fifty billion. So, if you do the math, if we do the math, it the war bonds funded more than half of the war uh, cost. So we can call that a, a success. And between 1942 and 1945, they were able to uh, to campaign for seven bond drives, but this didn't include the seven bond drives didn't include the post-war victory loan drive. Um, but they had seven successful bond drives. There it is. So as I'm doing my research for the war, uh, the war bond drives, I was trying to um, trying to step out of just looking at the posters that you know we that are so popular when we talk about war bond drives, and which you will also see um, in all my slides. I include a lot of these posters and stepping out of just looking at the gaze from the Treasury Department, but focusing on grassroots efforts and local communities and seeing what they're doing to fundraise for these war bonds. Um, and so in what I found that there was a diverse, diverse communities uh, contributing to raising and fundraising money for these for war bonds. And this included rural, rural and urban areas. Um, their strategies were in my opinion, really creative. Um, they held town rallies, they had window displays, they had farm to farm canvassing, they did performance based fundraisers, and you know, we'll get into other types of strategies that they used as well. Um, and one of the <clears throat> important things uh, when talking about public history and how do we commemorate and preserve is looking at uh, preserve war bond efforts um, is looking at public places. And thankfully, I think in the research that I found with the war bonds was that because these were largely community efforts and the success of these war bond drives relied on community, public places were central to fundraising and hosting these war bond drives. And these included public squares, parks, schools, movie theaters, local businesses, and municipal halls and other spaces. So when we think about, I wanted to point this out because when we, as we start to think about, you know, what do we preserve and how do we preserve it? It's not just, you know, and as public historians, you know, in this uh, webinar can attest to, it's not just about, you know, these monuments or, um, you know, uh, museums, but thinking about how other institutions like uh, K through 12 schools or universities were not only involved in war bonds, but how they have uh, preserved um, some of that history as well. Uh, even movie theaters, and we'll get into that. Let me go ahead and move over to that. So for war bonds, um, for war bonds, I looked into New Orleans. New Orleans had a vibrant African American community, Black American community, that successfully raised over five million dollars of war bonds. This is equal to over sixty nine million, and you can get that precise number on my slide: sixty nine million seven hundred and sixty three thousand two hundred twelve dollars. That's a lot of money. The African-American community in New Orleans raised this money through different organizations, clubs, through school efforts, through universities. Uh, one of the examples was um, through the National Negro Business League, which formed the National Organizing Committee of War Bond Savings Club. And what this War Bond Savings Club did was instead of them having to pay a fee directly to the 
to the organization, they actually chart their charge was that members purchased a $25 war bond, but they were required to purchase a $25 war bond per month. The $25 war bond, in case you don't know, is equal to $351 today. So every month, these members were paying and purchasing a $25 war bond. In uh, Booker T. Washington High School in New Orleans as well, they organized film screenings, um, such as a flyer that you see here. They organized a film screening uh, where they showcased a film about African-American soldiers. They also had musical performances and musical performance uh musical performances, um, and they invited students and the larger community to these efforts. Um, they also held parades and rallies. And so when looking at, um, again, organizations, thinking about these kind of more local community grassroots organizations, but also ones that transcend institutions, like we're looking at these clubs in school and um these students that are involved in organizing these type of initiatives that benefit the war bond campaigns during World War II. One of the other, um, the other um, areas of research that I was able to get into was the local and national media outlets. Um, of course, we are familiar with them uh, because they are one. That's how uh, President Roosevelt announced uh, the war, the war bond initiative, the defense bond initiative, and his purchasing. But also thinking about all the advertisement that they put out in magazines by 1942, 500 magazines across the nation displayed war bonds on its covers. Um, if you think about radio shows. Um, in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, there was a radio marathon of a, a 16 hour mar radio marathon where singer Kate Smith um, got pledges from listeners for over $40 million worth of bonds. Um, other radio, radio, uh, radio stations um, also hosted radio bond days where they would have their listeners phone in and pledge again. Um, for more war bonds. So when we look at, um, again, when we're researching and trying to figure out, okay, where are war bonds um, being bought? Think about also the ways in which these local and national media outlets are contributing to that and are themselves a type of organization or institution that are um, inviting um, citizens to participate in these campaigns. For businesses, <clears throat> um, I believe I didn't, uh, so for businesses, uh, what they ended up doing with some of the, what they ended up doing to try to get, um, you know, more people involved and automatically enrolled, which is a secure way of, or, or I should say a, a sure way of securing money for war bonds was that they started deducting 10% of employers' wages um, through their paychecks. And this became known as a payroll savings program. By 1945, $25 million from the payroll savings programs had been used to purchase war bonds. Um, another example from Portland, Oregon, and Portland, Oregon, the great thing about Portland, I would say, and I use this as an example because they have a digital preservation, uh, digital uh, archive where they really delve deep into the different types of war bond activities that, that their local community did. And what really stood out was this... Um, kind of massive war bond drive that department stores and retailers and businesses were were organizing where they had 561 women volunteers managing these war bond booths 
Um, and these were managed not just like in the outside public squares or public meeting places, but sometimes in hotel lobbies. Some of the hotel hotels that were involved in this are listed in here as well. The Benson Hotel, the the Bu Heathman Hotel, Woolworths, Five and Dime stores, so stores as well, Penny Store. So you have these different types of uh, businesses coming together um, and and raising this money for war bonds. Um, and I wanted to include the diversity of type of businesses so that it can help us kind of um, really think about, you know, what types of businesses were out there doing this type of work. And in Oregon, we're able to see that these hotel stores and theaters had over 561 women volunteering for this. For Hollywood, for movie theaters, the movie theaters, um, the Hollywood aspect is a little bit more well known when it comes to uh, the selling of war bonds because um, they were heavily involved in advertising and mobilizing support for the war. They, um, stars like Judy Garland and Lucille Ball and James Cagney were heavily involved, including others, Mickey Rooney as well, in, in, swaying support and getting people to buy war bonds so the way that I um the way that I interpret you know their contributions is that they were in a way using their like ability and donating their talents to to sell um war bonds and sell democracy um, one of the artists as well was Irving Berlin, who wrote Any Bonds Today. And his story is actually, um, his story is interesting. Um, he was hired by by the Treasury Department to, to write a song. Any Bonds Today became the official song for the war bond campaign. And it eventually was used as a advertisement commercial for Bugs Bunny, for a Bugs Bunny production. Um, and the producer, the even the song, the songwriter donated all of their talents in order to make money for war bonds. So the Bugs Bunny commercial was produced at no charge. The songwriter Irving Berlin donated all his proceeds to war bonds. And um, of course, in movie theaters where, you know, some of these... Um, Hollywood stars were hosted for events, they would donate those proceeds to war bond drives as well. The photo that you see here is the photograph, the last known photograph, one of the last known photographs of Carol Lombard uh, singing the Star Spangled Banner um, on January 15, 1942. Um, she had raised over $2 million dollars um, and was only expected, I think, to raise $5,000, and she ended up raising over $2 million. She was a well-known uh, movie star. Um, her husband, I believe, was Clark Gable as well, um, who was in the committee for uh, mobilizing war support. And so she became um, one of the first Hollywood stars to promote the sale of bonds and unfortunately passed away after this appearance in a plane crash. <clears throat> For movie theaters, um, you could, they set it up to where uh, moviegoers could purchase war bonds at the box office. Some of them even accepted war bonds or showing their war bonds to as an admittance in, as admission into the into the movie theater and if they weren't purchasing uh war bonds at the box office or they didn't have box offices then ushers would actually go down through the movie theater aisles and uh collect donations or sell them themselves there um and I thought that was really interesting um especially you know when you think about movie theaters you the first um, idea that it, that that at least I tied to movie theaters was, oh, of course, they show films that promote and mobilize support for the war, but it wasn't just showing movies. Uh, employees at movie theaters and movie theaters themselves were used to sell war bonds at the box office and the 
you know, during productions and, you know, as waste, you know, and encouraging them to use uh, war bonds as an admission ticket. Educational institutions. This is one of the most popular ones that a lot of people know about because this is one of the campaigns that got youth, school children, aged youth um, involved in being active participants in the war. Um, they had a the Treasury Department, along with the Department of Education, ran a schools at war campaign where they would where they would um, promote the sell uh the purchase of the stamps um, because knowing that, you know, children don't have as much money as probably their parents there, they wouldn't uh, encourage them to buy at 10 cent increments and put them in this kind of in a book, right. In this book. And once they, once they reached an $18 and 75 cents, uh, then they could turn that in for that $25 war bond because they wouldn't, they would be purchasing it at a $75 or 75% rate. Um, and so this became the, this became really um, not just as a way for them to think patriotically about, you know, their role even in the war and the way that they can contribute, but by filling up those stamp books, it became kind of like an entertaining um, initiative for, to, for children to get involved in the war bond campaign um and at the end of the day i believe uh well not i believe uh children ended up selling at in these schools at war campaigns 1.5 billion dollars worth of bonds <clears throat> So one of the most interesting one of the most interesting aspects of this research um, was finding out and learning more um, about the All Soldier Indian Dance Show. Um, this was an it it was an initiative originally by tribes and in New Mexico and Oklahoma to preserve the heritage. Um, and once they were in the military through this, through, through the uh, 45th Infantry Division, um, they were sent to Fort Devens, Massachusetts. And when they got to Massachusetts, they encountered a lot of discrimination um, and racism. And so one of the things that the that they use was their cultural heritage uh, to educate these Bostonians um, about their culture and to also challenge these stereotypes that they had of Native Americans as quote uneducated or uneducated savages end quote right and so they use this way as a way to educate to celebrate and to also um, challenge you know these these stereotypes that they were facing in this new place because before they were stationed in Oklahoma so now they're in Massachusetts in a whole different type of environment environment with hostile treatment um and in the beginning when they first started hosting these dance shows the very first one uh was on October 7 1942 they were only expected to sell $500 worth of war bonds and stamps. And that's all that was provided. And they ended up selling $5,000. They continue to do this dance uh, through Boston, throughout Boston, uh, through public squares, school, churches, local fairs and hospital. And by the end of the, by the end of their, their service, they had, um, they had raised seven, $75,000 in war bonds. And this, I wouldn't say, you know, it changed the way that Bostonians looked at them, but it definitely, you know, helped build some bridges, you know, during this wartime kind of fervor, uh, fervor of patriotism and belonging to, you know, the nation. So 
so I just kind of went briefly through some of the highlights that I that I mentioned during my um, or in my essay. Um, and so some of the recommendations that I, you know, would give um, through my expertise um, is to, you know, when you think about organizations, businesses and institutions um, and thinking how they're preserving, I would also recommend going through school records, um, school newspapers. You know, these students have a lot of these uh, school newspapers where um where a lot of these initiatives are being promoted, um, not only for the student body, but for the larger community to, to get to know what the students are doing in schools, the theaters, the stores, um, and of course, the more traditional historical society archives, which I have found some really amazing stuff now with the digitization of a lot of the, of, of the work. Um, that has been done by these societies and, and archives. Um, <clears throat> and again, I would, and I have partnerships listed there in public history projects because I also would encourage, um, and then maybe this is because this is what I do with my teaching and, and working with local museums here in San Antonio, Texas, is you know thinking of ways to collaborate with uh, student, looking for ways for my students in classrooms to collaborate with local history initiatives uh, because, you know, sometimes communities or cities or townships don't have the resources or the manpower to do the research and nominate and preserve. Um, and this is where partnership and co collaboration really becomes very fruitful and beneficial, not just for you know, these certain individuals and, and institutions that are, or organizations that are um, part of, you know, trying to make this a city, but it's, it's a community, it becomes a community initiatives to, you know, uh, promote, um, promote their city, um, as mentioned in previous, in the previous um, webinar series. Um, but with that, I'll leave you um, you can ask me any questions. I probably skipped over some information, but you can find more details on in my essay. And um, yeah, we'll end it there. Thank you so much for that fabulous presentation. That was wonderful. And it was striking me that um, I'm, it's interesting that we scheduled this on Giving Tuesday with all this think about raising giant sums of money while we're all getting tons of <laughs> emails asking for some of money. Um, and as we wait for anyone who has questions for um, Dr. Oviedo, you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom. You're welcome to unmute yourself. You're welcome to type your questions in the chat. Um, we can be pretty informal here and we just want to be able to answer any questions that you have or dig into this content a little deeper. Um, as we uh, wait for questions to come in, I had um, one that I thought I would just start with, which is, um, you know, as someone who has worked and researched in this area before, um, is there something that really surprised you as you dug more into this or like a place where you found information that you were just surprised by? I'm just curious if, you know, if there was anything kind of new that you that you came across as you were revisiting this work? Sorry, okay. Um, I accidentally moved the screen a little bit. I was like getting lost here. Um, so the most surprising thing I found, the most interesting at this point was the, Well, one, I had never known about the um, about the old Indian dan dance shows, you know, and I'm someone who has researched the experiences of African Americans in the military, of Latinos in the military, um, and a little bit of, of Native Americans in the military, but n mostly women. And so it was very interesting to find that out and to see how um, 
they use kind of the cultural heritage and customs in a way to promote um to promote the war effort to help the war effort despite the relationship to the United States right and so i really found that um I found that really interesting, but I found that very empowering too, because, you know, when these moments are highlighted in these histories of, you know, yeah, there was all these moments, I mean, you know, throughout World War history, World War II history that we see, there was all these great things happening, but there was all these not so great things happy for communities of color. Um, and so to see these kind of things and for them to turn around and kind of challenge the stereotypes um, through that, but at the same time, being able to raise money for the war bonds and exceed the amount that they were expected to sell, man, that was, I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's amazing. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat. The first one um, we have is from Dennis, who asks, I'm wondering if the Liberty Loan drives of the First World War inform or influence these later wartime efforts. Um, of course, I think that the history of bonds themselves are informative year after or time after time that they're being used, um, with the Liberty bonds themselves, um, they were, um, they, they were used as well to garner support, um, as far as like intricacies of the war bonds during World War One. Um, I know that they, were also um, in a way like made up, well, I guess this also gets at the other, the next question of how successful was the World War II bond effort, right? So thinking, comparing, like comparing, you know, the success of these Liberty bonds and then the, the war bonds of World War II, um, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the World War II bonds, um, if we do the math, they raised $185 billion of war bonds and the total war, the cost of the war was 350 billion. That is a little bit more than half. Um, so I find that successful, um, especially looking at these little tiny minute or minute case studies of these different initiatives, right? By community local that were exceeding the amounts that they expected um, from these uh organized initiatives and with the liberty bonds too they the liberty bonds funded world war one basic two-thirds of the war as well so thinking about the intricacies um of the liberty bonds i'm not i wouldn't be able to get too much into that today but i would be able to compare that to, with the success of the World War II bonds um, and how much they helped to finance the war at the end of the day. Yeah, and it would be interesting to think about mm -hmm. how the changes in the economy between the two wars would have changed people's capacity mm -hmm. to purchase bonds. So that is fascinating. Thank you so much. Other questions from our participants today? We will welcome. And as we're waiting for those to come in, oh, um, Megan asks, I love World War I war bond art. How were the artists selected? Do you know? Um, I'm kind of glad you brought up the artist, right? Because the one that comes, okay, well, let me answer your question. And then I'll go off into something that I kind of skipped over during my, in my presentation, but it is mentioned. And I'm pretty sure you all know um, about um, Norman Rockwell, right? But I unfortunately don't know how the war bond artists were selected. Um, specifically with war bonds. I know about some other artists um, regarding, you know, other campaigns, um, foreign diplomacy campaigns and some of the artists that they picked for that. But as far as the war bonds, I wasn't, I didn't get enough information. I didn't get information about that. So unfortunately I would not be able to answer that question about how specifically artists were selected. Um, but, you know, in that conversation, I really wanted to get into how artists 
not just Hollywood actors, but how artists um, also contributed their talents, right? Um, and, you know, we're talking about giving, giving Tuesday. Well, one of the things that I did at the National Museum was looking at war and philanthropy, right? How war impacted philanthropy. Um, but I was trying not to get into a whole tunnel about thinking about how these Hollywood artists, um, even the, the songwriter for the war bond uh, theme song contributed their talents. Um, and, you know, even the monetary, uh, the monetary, um, I guess the money that they were bringing in for for that, they were donating it. Um, and one of them was Norman Rockwell. I mean, his paintings on the Four Freedoms became a whole traveling exhibit um, across 16, I believe, 16 cities across the United States and raised over, raised millions and millions of dollars. And so, um, yeah, I was not able to answer that first part, but... <laughs> um, I'm glad you brought that up because that is another form of, in my words, war and philanthropy and how they're able to contribute their talents. Thank you so much. And as we wait for any last um, questions to come in, I wanted to remind everyone that we have three more presentations this week. Um, tomorrow, also at 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Central, We'll explore um, criteria for adaptations to wartime survival. On Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern, we'll look at criteria five, volunteer participation. And on Friday, um, I'm very excited because there are, for those of you who have studied the, the um, legislation for the World War II heritage cities, you'll see that there were nine official criteria. And after the series of essays were written, um, my colleagues at NCPH and the Park Service talked together really about how, how there were some gaps that we kind of identified in the um, criteria that, that Congress drew out. And so we worked with Dr. Oviedo to um, commission a 10th criteria essay on diversification of the American World War II homefront workforce. So we will wrap up the week with that. And I thank you so much, Dr. Oviedo, for giving us your time this week, especially with a baby at home and the post-Thanksgiving holiday. Um, so it is a pleasure um, to learn more from you for this work. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I don't want to keep folks. We have three more opportunities this week um, to dig into this content. Um, so if you come up with questions in the meantime, please keep them for tomorrow or shoot us an email with your questions and we'll make sure to get to them. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Oviedo for a fantastic presentation and I hope to see many of you again tomorrow. Right. Bye.